All right, let's get started. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. Yes. Perfect. Yes. All right. Um, so before we start, uh, I already have a question um, from Aisatu. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing your name uh, correctly. Um, who says, are there any suggestions you can give us for studying for the second midterm? Um, so the, the first thing I would do to prepare for that midterm is really to go over all the problem sets and to do them at least twice, okay? To be sure that you are comfortable with them. And then in the second step, you may want to do some extra practice. And in that case, you can just let me know and I can send some extra practice question, okay? Um, so for instance, I can tell you uh, work on that problem in that book chapter. Okay, in, in some problem set, I have, I've put recommended uh, problems that are in the books. That's also uh, problems that you may wanna uh, try. Um, but I would say the first step will be really to go over the problem set and to be sure that you are comfortable with them. Okay. Does it answer your question? All right. So another question, can you give more specification about the optional final? Okay. So the optional final is an exam for those who are not happy with uh, your course grade. Okay, I'm going to compute your course grade based on uh, the grade you have on homeworks and on the grade you got on the two midterms. So I'm going to compute that and I will give you a temporary letter grade. That would be your course grade. If you are not happy with that grade, you can take this optional final and um, the grade you would get at this optional final would replace the two midterm grade, okay? So initially in the syllabus, I wrote that uh, the grade you get for the optional final would substitute to the two midterm grades, uh, whether it, it would be higher or lower. But now what I will do, I will just take uh, the maximum of uh, both grades. So the maximum between the optional final and the maximum between uh, the two midterm grades. Okay. All right. So the optional final is cumulative, which means that you will need to review all the material from the beginning. And uh, I also expect it to be a little bit more difficult. Okay, it, it, will, uh, it will be a little bit more challenging than the midterms. Uh, how many questions? Um, so I, I don't, do I we, don't know yet. We have a choice of uh, taking it either way. So for example, let's say we do the midterms and then we're not happy with the grade and then we might take the finals. But let's say however you take the finals, but you got lower grade in the finals or higher grade in the finals, which, how are you going to do that then? I'll just take the base grade between both. Okay, I'm, I'm going to compute the average of the two midterms and I'm going to compare this average to the grade you get at the optional final. Okay, and I'm simply uh, keeping the highest of the two. Okay. Professor. Um, yep. For uh, obviously the class, it's pass fail, like a credit, no credit options, but yep. you know how it affects, let's say my major is uh, like this class is required for me because I'm an economics major. Do you know how it would have, am I, since I, this is a major, do, do I still have the option to make it a pass fail class? 
Um, I have to check uh, that. I so I believe that okay, it's a pass fail, but say you get an A in that class, it would still appear as an A. Am I am I wrong? No, it will act like no credit or no credit. Say again. It will act like a credit or no credit. It's only credit or no credit. I, no, no, I no. Have... You you could choose to credit no credit it, and if you don't choose, then you get the actual letter grade. Okay. Um, can I add something? So there is similar requirement for my finance major, and I asked this okay. question about my finance class, and I was told. Then mm -hmm. even if I take pass, but there is like a certain GPA that needs to be maintained with uh, within like four or three courses, like it's still fine. Like it, that, uh, even though it's in my major class, I was told that it's still okay if I take it as a, a credit grade. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Thank okay, you. no problem. Great. All right. Um, okay, is there other question? Oh, I also okay. have a question. So, yeah. will studying for the um, from the problem set will be also helpful for the optional final, or it will not yes. be really helpful? Yes, for the, yeah, for the optional final, you just review all the problem set, and you might want also to do some uh, problem from the book. Okay. 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 Thank you. It's gonna be a little bit more challenging, but it will still be very similar to what we have done. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, no, no more question. Okay. All right. So, um, chapter 12. So the plan for today is to cover a sub sample of the oligopoly chapter, okay? So the chapter on oligopolies is super dense. And for me, it was very difficult to see what I would cover because I typically uh, cover all the models in that chapter in one semester at NYU. So I found a little bit crazy that they put so many information in only one chapter. Um, so I have picked up what are the essential models of oligopolies, okay? So today we are going to focus on uh, what is the most important in that chapter, okay? So just to review, uh, to, to give a little bit uh, background here, uh, so what are oligopolies? So, so far we have studied perfect competition, which are market situation in which you have many firms, okay? So that's one extreme. And we have also studied um, monopolies. So that's the other extreme. You have only, only one firm uh, in the market. So oligopolies um, basically is any market situation that lie um, between perfect competition and monopolies, okay? So in oligopolies, you have a market with few firms, okay? But more than one firm and here we are going to focus on the case where you have two firms and when you have two firms we call that a duopoly okay so in general all the results we're going to get here are uh, can be general generalized to market with many firms with more than two firms but for simplicity we are just going to study the case with two firms so Second point, uh, with oligopolies, product may be differentiated or not, okay? So here I choose to stick with the simplest case in which products are homogeneous, okay? So we are de dealing with the same product. The two firms on the market are supplying exactly the same product. All right. Um, one important point with oligopolies is that we have basically two cases. So we have two firms on the market and they are going to choose either the price they're going to set on that market or the quantity they're going to set. Remember, when we talk about a monopolist, 
we say the monopoly is facing a decreasing inverse demand curve, is facing the market demand, and it can either choose what quantity to produce and then deduce the price, the market price, or you can set the market price and then deduce the quantity that's going to be produced. Okay, so there is this one to one relationship between price and quantity when we talk about monopolies. With oligopolies, it's going to be different. So we are considering two cases. In the first set of models, we are going to consider firm that are going to choose the quantity they're going to produce. Okay, so you have two firms on the market. Each firm is going to set its individual quantities, and then you're going to determine the market price based on the aggregate quantity set by those two firms. Okay, an alternative to this, a second case, is where these two firms. Uh, compete in price. So instead of setting quantity, firm are going to set price. So the firm is going to say, okay, I'm going to sell that good for uh, $3 and the other firm uh, on his side is going to uh, set another price. Okay, so two cases, either firms compete in quantity, either they compete in price. In both cases, the way we're going to deal with this kind of models um, rely on game theory, okay? So every equilibrium that we are going to investigate here will be a Nash equilibrium, okay? So remember, what is a Nash equilibrium? A Nash equilibrium is a situation in which each agent, so here we are talking about firm, each firms want to do the best given the choice of its opponent, okay? So how are we going to determine uh, the price and the quantity that are going to prevail in equilibrium? So as I said, we are going to use the Nash equilibrium, but the result, the market outcome, will depend on several uh, parameters of the problem. In particular, it's going to depend on the variable on which firms compete. So whether they compete in price or in quantity, we'll get a very uh, different result. Okay, so that's the first parameter. The second parameter that's going to play a role is the timing of the moves. Okay, so um, we are going to start with a scenario in which firms are going to decide simultaneously of uh, the quantity or the price they want to set. Okay, so they're going to decide at the same time. And then we're going to move to a case in which one firm is going to set the quantity and then a second firm move after and observe the choice made by the first firm and then it's going to set its quantity. Okay, so we'll cover both the case in which the decision is made simultaneously by the firm and the case in which one firm decides before the other. Um, the last um, parameters that's going to change here is uh, whether firms are going to meet on the market either a finite or an infinite number of times. Okay, the result, the market outcome will be very different uh, if firm meets once or if firm meets several times on the market. Okay. So as I said, there are many models uh, of imperfect competition. In this problem set, we're going to start by studying the corner model. Okay, so in the corner model, firm are going to compete in quantity. So each firm is going to set its optimal quantity, um, anticipating what the other firm is choosing. Okay, so given that I expect that my opponent is choosing quantity QB, I'm going to set quantity QA. Okay, so. In corner competition, the decisions will be simultaneous. Okay, both firms are going to decide at the same time. Okay, so that's the first uh, model we are going to cover. Then we'll move to the Stackelberg model. So 
In the Stackelberg model, firms compete in quantity, unlike in the Krono model, but one firm is going to set the quantity first, and the second firm is going to react to that. Okay. The third model uh, will be the Bertrand model. So with the Bertrand model, firms compete in price and not in quantity, and they're going to decide simultaneously. Okay, so both firms are going to decide at the same time what will be the price of that product. The fourth model we are going to cover is a Bertrand model with tacit collusion. Okay. So here, basically, what we're going to do, we are going to assume that the Bertrand setting is going to repeat um, an indefinite number of times. And we will see that um, the Nash equilibrium that is going to emerge will be a collusive equilibrium. OK? So I have reported here the relevant sections of the book, so 12.1, 12.2. I also mentioned the paragraphs that you can skip. I really encourage you to read those sections. It's not super long, so I believe that you can take the time to read them. And it's going to help you understand better what we're going to do today. OK? Um, I'm just going uh, to give you a little bit of background, but I, I can lecture, so I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to go really fast. OK, so the first problem. So the first problem is uh, on the Kono and Stackelberg's oligopolies. So what happened here? So we have a, a stream. A stream is discovered whose water has remarkable healing powers. Okay? So you decide to bottle the liquid and sell it. So we have the, the market demand curve. And uh, we are given the marginal cost to produce this new drink. Okay, it's three dollars per drink per bottle. So the first two questions are relative, relatively easy. The idea here is to set a benchmark. So the first question is what will be the level of output QPC and price PPC in the long run? if this industry were perfectly competitive. Okay, so here we want to know what would be the uh, equilibrium, assuming that um, this is a market of perfect competition. Okay, and then calculate the profit. So how do we do that? Okay. So for question one, as usual, when you are in a situation of perfect competition, you are going to set price equals marginal cost. Okay, that is going to give you your uh, equilibrium. Okay, so price equals marginal cost uh, implies 30 minus Q equals, sorry, I skipped a step. Okay, so price equals marginal cost mean price is going to, to be equal to three, okay, three dollars. And what will be, so that's price under perfect competition. And what will be the equilibrium quantity in that market? Well, you just plug uh, the price in the market demand curve, okay. So you end up with three equals to 30 minus Q. And so QPC is going to be 27. OK? Right. So what are the profits? Um, well, we are under perfect competition. So you know that price equals marginal cost, which means that the profit is going to be 0. So the profit here is going to be 0. OK, so here we have our benchmark. So now let's move to question two. So question two um, 
is what is the profit maximizing level of output QM and price PM if the market is served by a monopolist? Okay, so um, we know how to solve this question. Assume the market is served by the monopolist. Well, it's gonna set optimal quantity such that marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Okay, so we have the demand curve. From the demand curve, we can deduce the marginal revenue. Okay, so marginal revenue, remember, you keep the same intercept and you double the slope. And this is going to be equal to marginal cost, which is three. Okay, so you have two Q equals 27 or QM equals 27 over two. Okay, so that the equilibrium quantity for a monopolist. Uh, what is the equilibrium price? So the equilibrium price is 30 minus QM, which is, um, so this is equal to 13.5. So the price is 16.5, okay? So nothing difficult so far. Calculate the profit. So what is the profit for the monopolist? So pi m is equal to price minus marginal cost times QM. So price is 16.5 minus marginal cost three times 27 over two. So if you calculate this, you end up with um, 182.25. All right, so I'm just going to highlight this. So that's the price, that the optimal quantity, and that the profit. Okay. All right. So now let's move to question three. Assume that the market is served by two firms, firm A and firm B what would be the market outcome if both firms form a cartel, okay? So in this question, we are going to assume that uh, firm A and firm B are gonna talk to each other and uh, they're gonna try to coordinate to increase their profits, okay? So now you have two firms on the market. Uh, what is the market situation in which you get the highest possible profit. Well, that's a monopolist situation, okay? But now that you have two firms on the market, the only way for them to reach the highest possible profit is to coordinate somehow on the monopolist uh, situation, okay? So what the firm are gonna do, assuming that they are able to form and to sustain a cartel, they are going to produce at the monopolist level and they are going to charge the monopolist price and they are going to split the profit equally between them, okay? So why are they splitting the profit equally here? Um, because we're going to assume that they have the same marginal cost, okay? So if both firm incur the same cost of producing a certain quantity, then the cartel solution implies that they are going to split uh, the production uh, equally between them, okay? So to find the equilibrium for the cartel, well, you want the uh, monopolist quantity to be the sum of the quantity produced by firm A and the quantity produced by firm uh, B, okay? So this implies that little qa will be equals to little Q uh, sub B, and that's gonna be 27 
over two divided by two. Okay? So each firm is going to produce 6.75 units. Okay? So because the total uh, market quantity produced by the cartel is the same as the monopolist quantity, then the price is going to be the same. So the price, I'm going to put cartel here. The price in the cartel case will be the same as the monopolist price. Okay, so that's going to be 16.5. Okay. So what are the profit? So the profit to firm A will be the same as the profit to firm B, okay? And because they are simply a splitting production, uh, then they're gonna get half of the monopolist profit, okay? So that's gonna be 182.25 divided by two, okay? So that's, uh, ninety one point a hundred twenty five. Okay. So, do you have question on this? Okay. So here we assume that um, the firm are able to commit to produce a quantity of 6.75H, okay? And that's uh, the only way they can reach the highest possible profit given that there are two firms on the market. So now the question is, will this market outcome occur? So in general, cartel, are not observed in the real world for at least two reasons. So the first reason um, is that cartels are illegal, okay? Why are they illegal? Because cartels are uh, an artificial way to restrict the quantity produced on the market, to restrict the quantity available on the market. And so this pushes the price at a high level, okay? and the antitrust authorities that don't want that, okay? So cartels are illegal. The second reason why we don't observe cartels in the real world is that um, they are not stable. The cartel equilibrium is not stable, okay? In other words, although this is a situation in which both firm can get the highest possible profit, this situation will never occur. Why? Because each firm has an incentive to cheat. Each firm has an incentive to deviate from this production QA. All right. So cartel is not, are not stable because firm each firm has an incentive to increase its production and gets higher profit. Okay, so someone mentioned, what about um, the OPEC, I guess, okay? So I don't know if you have uh, watched the news recently, but um, I believe it was two weeks ago, the price of gasoline uh, was super, super low, okay? And actually, yeah, and um, so the market for gasoline is one of the markets where you can find a cartel. Why? Because antitrust laws are laws in the United States and they also exist in Europe they don't exist in the rest of the world. So different countries can coordinate to set the production level not too high, and this drives the price of gasoline up, 
okay? So they can coordinate to restrict production and to end up with uh, high profits. And as your uh, classmate mentioned here, they tried to coordinate, two weeks ago, they tried to coordinate because the price of gasoline was going down like crazy. It became negative at some point. Why? Because Russia cheated on their agreement, okay? They decided to restrict production because they saw that the price of ga gasoline was going down. They said, well, let's produce less and this is going to reverse uh, the curve. And well, everyone said, okay, let's do that. But then Russia didn't, uh, didn't uh, respect this agreement, okay? So that's an example that shows that cartels are not stable uh, most of the time, okay? All right, but we're gonna, we're gonna see uh, in the last problem that some kind of collusion between firms can emerge when firms meet um, several times on the market, okay? So some kind of, not cartel, but what we call collusion, tacit collusion can happen on some market in some market, okay? So do you have question on this? All right. Okay. Um, so the cartel solution, so each firm will get a profit of 91. All right. So now let's move to question four. So the market is now served by a duopolist uh, consisting of, of firm A and firm B. And here we are not going to assume that they have made an agreement, okay? So both firms are going to determine their optimal quantity um, based on the beliefs they have of the quantity produced by the other firm. Okay, so how, how do we determine what we call the Kono Nash equilibrium? Okay, so in other words, the equilibrium, the cartel equilibrium here, is unstable. So this is not a Nash equilibrium. Okay, this is not a Nash equilibrium. And what we are looking for now is what would be a stable market outcome. And this stable market outcome will be a Nash equilibrium. Okay, so let's move to this. Um, all right. So what is the process um, of decision for a firm belonging to a duopoly? So if you think about monopolies, okay, for monopolies, you have the demand curve, the marginal revenue curve, and the marginal cost curve like this, okay? And the monopoly set the optimal quantity where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, okay? So now we have two firms on the market. So let's say that, um, let's say that I am firm A. How I'm going to determine uh, the quantity I'm going to produce depending on the quantity chosen by firm B, okay? So let's draw the market demand here. And I'm gonna say that this market demand is the market demand that firm A faces when firm B produces zero, okay? So when firm B doesn't produce anything, then what I'm facing as firm A is simply the total market demand, okay? Now, uh, Let's say that firm B is producing some quantity, QB. Then what am I facing? Well, if firm B is producing some quantity, some positive quantity QB, I'm gonna change the color here. Then I'm going to face what we call a residual demand curve. Okay, so let's say that's the demand curve when from B, let's say produce like 25 units, okay? So when from B produce 25 units, then 
the demand curve that I'm facing is the original demand curve shift to the left by 25. Okay. And we call this demand curve the residual demand curve. So assume that I know that firm B is going to produce 25 units. What is my best response to that? Well, I'm going to draw the marginal cost curve. Okay. And I'm going to draw the marginal revenue curve here. Okay. So if firm B produces 25 units, I'm going to optimally react by producing where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And so my best response to firm B producing 25 units will be producing a quantity QA of, let's say, 12 units. OK? So that the process uh, followed by firm A so firm A determine its optimal quantity given its belief about what will be the production from firm B. Okay? So here I have draw the case in which uh, firm B is producing 25 units. But you can draw all the cases. You can say, well, uh, I believe that firm B is going to produce 50 units. So in that case, I'm going to shift the original demand curve by 50. And that's the new curve I'm going to face. OK, so that's the new uh, demand. OK. When QB equals 50. OK, so how do I determine optimal quantity in that case? Well, if I believe that from B is going to produce 50, then again, I'm going to look at the intersection between marginal revenue and marginal cost. I'm going to produce QA well, equals something less like five. Okay. So using this graph, you can see that um, you can calculate all the best responses of firm A to the different quantity produced by firm B. Okay. So from that graph, you are able to draw what we call a best response curve or a re reaction curve. And this curve says, well, let's put QA here on the vertical axis and QB on the horizontal axis. This reaction curve gives you the optimal quantity QA that firm A is going to produce for all the possible quantity QB. Okay, so that's what we call the best response. Of firm A to the quantity produced by firm B. Okay, so, um, okay, so for instance, I, I look at at my blue curve here, I said when QB produced 25 units, then the optimal response, so when QB produced 25 units, the optimal response for firm A was to produce 12 units. Okay. And when firm B produced 50 units, when the best response to that was for firm A to produce five units. Okay. So you can see how from this graph, we can derive the best response function. Okay. All right. So now that you understand what happens, we're going to do the math. Okay, I'm going to erase this. So how do we solve this kind of, um, this kind of problem? 
Okay. So first, uh, remember we have the market demand, and the market demand was uh, thirty minus Q. Okay. So now you need to be aware that Q is the sum of Q A plus Q B. Okay. You have two firm on the market. So our market demand is 30 minus QA minus QB. Okay. So the equilibrium we are looking for here is the intersection between marginal cost and marginal revenue, accounting for the fact that firm B is producing QB. Okay. So here I'm going to first solve the problem of firm A. So firm A is going to set marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Okay. The thing is marginal revenue is going to be a little bit different this time. So what is total revenue? So total revenue, first notice that it's going to depend on both the quantity QA and the quantity QB. Okay. And this is going to be P times QA. So that's total revenue for firm A, which is 30 minus QA minus QB times QA. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to develop this. So 30 QA minus um, QA squared minus QA QB. Okay. So what is the marginal revenue? The marginal revenue is the derivative of total revenue with respect to uh, QA. Okay, so you're gonna take the derivative of um, this expression here with respect to QA. So you end up with 30 minus two QA minus QB. And you set this equal to marginal cost, which is three. Okay. So basically what you are looking for here is this intersection for any uh, quantity QB, okay? For any quantity QB. All right, so now I'm going to express QA as a function of QB, okay? And this is going to give me the best response. So QA, sorry, I have two QA equals uh, 27, minus QB or QA equals uh, 27 minus QB over two, okay? So this is um, the best response, best response of A to Okay. All right. So what the next step here? Well, now that firm A knows how to best respond to any quantity set by firm B, well, I want to find what uh, will be the best response of firm B to any quantity set by firm A. Okay. So I want to solve the symmetric problem here. So what will firm A do, uh, B do, okay? So firm B is going to do exactly the same. It's going to set marginal revenue of firm B equals marginal cost. So here there is a shortcut. Because when um, both firm have the same marginal cost, you know that both firm are going to have the same uh, best response. You just need to substitute QA with QB and uh, QB with QA. Okay, so I know that the best response of firm B to any quantity set by QA is going to be QB equals 27 minus QA divided by 2. Okay, so you just look at the best response of QA and you replace A by B and B by A. 
All right. Okay, so um, so I, I'm going to draw the best response right now to see what our equilibrium will be. Okay, so I'm going to put uh, QA, QB. All right, so if you look at uh, this, when uh, QB is zero, QA is uh, 13.5. So when QB is zero, QA is 13.5. Okay. And when QA is equal to zero here, then you find that QB is 27. Okay. Okay, so that's um, okay, so that's the best response of firm A, okay? So now I can draw the best response to firm um, B. And uh, because the expression here is symmetric, then it's going to be easy, okay? So I know that I'm going to cross the vertical axis here at 13.5. And here I'm going to cross the horizontal axis at 27. Okay. All right, so that's best response of firm B. Okay. So, what is the Corno Nash equilibrium here? Remember when we cover uh, game theory. We said that the Nash equilibrium was the intersection of the best responses. Okay, so the Nash equilibrium here is going to be where BRA and BRB intersect. So that's Nash. We call it the Corno Nash, Corno Nash equilibrium. Okay, that's the Corno Nash equilibrium. So now that we know how to find the corner Nash equilibrium, let's uh, let's find optimal quantity QA and QB. All right. Okay, so Nash equilibrium. So basically, we want to solve uh, a system of two equations here. Okay. So let's start with. Um, let's start with this uh, equation, and I'm going to plug the value QB in that equation, okay? All right, so QA is equal to 27 over 2 minus 1 half QB. And what is QB? So QB is here. So QB is 27 minus QA over 2. Okay. So QA is 27 over 2 minus 27 over 4 plus uh, QA over 4. Okay. So this implies um, So you, you put uh, the QA on, on the left hand side. So you have three quarter of QA equals um, 27 over two minus 27 over four, okay? And if you compute this, you find the corner quantity for firm A. And this is, Sorry, Professor. Yes. Um, how did you get 27 over 2 minus a half? Um, 
Okay, so your question is about that? Yes. Okay, so this is... Uh, wait. So this is QB. Okay. Uh, let me rewrite that. So if you look at QA, QA can be rewritten as 27 over 2 minus 1 half QB. Okay. I got it, thank you. Okay, great. All right, so optimal quantity QA in the corner equilibrium is nine. Okay. Um, now we just need to get the optimal quantity QB. So you simply uh, plug QA in the best response function of firm B. Okay, so Q B in Kono is 27 over two minus one half times nine. And it gives you a quantity of nine. Okay. Okay, so exactly, because it's symmetric. Okay, so one, once you get the quantity for one firm, you don't need to calculate the, quant the quantity for the other firm. Okay, it's gonna be the same. Uh, it's gonna be the same as long as they have both the same marginal cost, okay? All right, so we have our Kono nash equilibrium. So now what is the market price? The market price, in Kono is 30 minus QAC minus QBC. So that's um, 12. Okay. The last thing uh, we wanna do is to calculate the profit. So the profit to any firm, okay, it's gonna be the same for firm A and firm B. So that's price minus marginal cost. So that's 12 minus three times uh, optimal quantity nine. So P, C, A or B is 81. Okay. Yes, uh, so the question uh, from Anisha, will we have to draw this graph for the exam? Yes, I can ask you that. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's look at the question. I believe we answered everything. Uh, optimal quantity, price, best response, functions, and profit. Okay. Do you have question on this? All right. So we can move on. Um, next question. Okay, so now we still have our two firms on the market and they are still competing in quantity. But now we assume that firm A is what we call the leader of Stackelberg. Basically firm A is going to set its quantity first and then firm B is going to observe the quantity set by firm A and react. Okay. Um, so basically what we have here is a sequential game, okay? So that's a sequential game in which um, the first player is firm A. So firm A is gonna set, firm A 
has a choice between um, different quantity QA, okay? And then firm B is going to observe the quantity QA and is going to respond to that. So how do we solve this kind of problem? Okay, so when we have a sequential game, remember what we are looking for is the subgame perfect equilibrium. Okay, so the question is how do we solve um, this kind of game? Well, we're going to use backward induction. Uh, it's going to look a little bit different from what we've done before, but basically that's backward induction. So what is backward induction? Remember, you start by the last stage of the game, so you're going to start solving for that stage okay so what do we know at that? what do we know in stage two so we know in stage two that from a from b from b is going to set qb following her best response okay and we know that best response okay so we know that if from a set a quantity QA in the first stage, then from B is going to set a quantity QB given by this equation. Okay. So now let's move to the first stage. What is the optimal uh, behavior for firm A? Well, firm A is going to set a quantity QA in the first stage, knowing that firm B is going to uh, react along the best response. Okay, so in other words, so what is changing here? What is changing is that firm A is going to take into account this information about the behavior from firm B when it calculates its marginal revenue. Okay, so let me show you that. So let's start with firm A. Okay, so firm B. Basically, we have solved the behavior for from B already. Okay, so we know that from B is gonna behave like that. Okay, so now let's move to from A. Let's let's move to the first stage of the game. So from A, so total revenue depends on QA and QB, and that's gonna be thirty minus QA minus QB times QA, okay? But from A, no QB, okay? It knows that QB is 27 minus QA divided by two, okay? So marginal revenue is gonna be 30 minus QA minus this times QA, okay? Uh, so I'm going to develop this. So this is 30 QA minus QA to the power two minus 27 over two QA plus QA squared over two. Okay. So now let's calculate the marginal revenue from A. So that's 30 minus 2QA minus 27 over 2 plus QA, okay? So if you compute this, you end up with minus QA plus 16.5, okay? Marginal revenue equals marginal cost, imply minus QA plus 16.5 equals three. And so QA for the Stackelberg leader is gonna be 13.5, okay? All right, so we have the quantity produced by the leader. Now, how do we determine the quantity produced by the follower by firm B. Well, we already know that. We know that firm B is going, is going to react 
to the quantity set by from a like this minus q s a divided by two. So that's 27 minus 13.5 divided by two, which gives q s b equals 6.75. Okay. So what is the total market quantity? Total market quantity in the Stackelberg equilibrium is going to be the sum of QAS and QBS. Okay, so that's gonna be 20.25. What is the market price? You just substitute 20.25 in the market demand, and so you get 9.75, okay? So you can, looking at the quantity, what can you tell about the profit here? Are the firm getting both the same profit as in the corner case? Yes, no. Well, if you look at the quantity, you can see that firm A is producing twice as much as firm B here, okay? And this firm has the same cost. So from this observation, you can conclude that the profit for the leader of the Stackelberg so the profit to firm A, the profit to firm A is going to be bigger than the profit to firm B, okay? In other words, when you have a scenario in which one of the firm can move first, then this firm is gonna get a higher profit than the firm that moves in second, okay? All right, so that the Stackelberg equilibrium. Um, so we say, just a point of terminology, that uh, in that case, there is a first mover advantage. It's not always the case. Moving first doesn't give you always a first mover advantage. Sometimes firms who move first are going to get a lower profit than the firm uh, moving second, okay? But when we talk about a corner setting, it will always be the case that the leader of Stackelberg is gonna get a higher profit. All right. Okay, so the last, uh, the last question is compare all the market equilibria. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, summarize what we have found here. And um, so I, I'm going to compare the price first. So the, the lowest possible price will be found in the perfect competition setting, okay? Um, then you're gonna get the price in the Stackelberg setting, the price in the corner setting, and the highest possible price will be the one set by a monopolist, okay? Now let's compare quantity. So the quantity will be the highest under perfect competition. You can check with the number we found, okay? Then, we have the quantity uh, in the Stackelberg competition, then the quantity in the corner competition, and then the quantity when you have a monopolist. Okay. Now let's compare uh, the profit. So the profit are the lowest under perfect competition. Okay. So 
So we didn't calculate the profit um, in Stackelberg, uh, but it should be uh, profit in Cornell, profit in Stackelberg, and monopolist profit. Okay. Okay, so that's just a comparison of the different uh, value of price, quantity, and profit in the different scenarios, okay? All right. Unless there's a question, I'm going to move uh, to the next problem. Okay. All right. So, um, now we move to the Bertrand model. Um, so in the Bertrand model, things are a little bit easier. So in that model, firms are going to compete in price and not in quantity. Um, we will see that the market outcome will be very different from uh, the one under Kono. And uh, for the Bertrand model, we need to make a couple of uh, assumptions. Okay. So basically, you're going to have um, two firms on that market, so firm A and firm B. And they are going to decide simultaneously on the price PA and PB they're going to set for the same product. Okay. So we need to make assumption on how the, the, the demand will be allocated between both firms in the different scenarios. Okay. So the first scenario is where both firms set the same price. Okay, so if both firms set the same price, then we are going to assume that the sales will be equally divided between firms. Okay, in other words, uh, firm A is going to produce the same quantity as firm B, and that's going to be half of the total market quantity. Okay. Then what happens if firm A set a price below the price set by firm B? Well, in that case, demand goes to the, to the lower price, okay? Because we're dealing with uh, a good that exactly the same, then the consumer are gonna get, are gonna buy from the firm that sell uh, the cheapest, for the cheapest, okay? So in that case, QA, is equal to the whole market demand. Last scenario, if firm A set the price above the one set by firm B, then QA gets no demand at all. Okay, so it's like demand is perfectly elastic uh, between firms. Okay, so, so that's the, the assumption we need to solve that problem. So what is Nash equilibrium here? So you, you don't need to solve anything here to find the Nash equilibrium. You just need to think a little bit about what would be the best response for say firm A to any of the price set by firm B, okay? So take uh, the situation where firm A set the same price as firm B. Can this be a Nash equilibrium? Well, no. So PA equals PB. This is not a Nash equilibrium. Why? Because firm A would be better off charging a price 
Pb minus epsilon, so charging just a little bit lower than the price charged by its opponent. And that way it gets all the market demand. So setting a price Pa equals to the price Pb is not a Nash equilibrium. Why? Because I have an incentive to undercut my opponent's price. Okay. Um, is setting a price PA above the marginal cost an equilibrium? Yes, so yeah. So Andre is anticipating, he says it goes to perfect competition. That's basically the idea. Okay, so we just need to check that. Um, that setting a price PA above marginal cost is not an equilibrium either, okay? So if this is an equilibrium, well, it's not gonna be a Nash equilibrium because if I set a price PA above marginal cost, then firm B is gonna set a price PA, uh, PB equals PA minus epsilon and gets all the demand, okay? So the only equilibrium that is stable here is where PA equals PB equals marginal cost. Okay, so I should have said this. Okay, so what is the outcome of the Bertram model? Well, it's both firm setting a price equals to marginal cost. And so the quantity produced by firm A is a quantity produced by firm B and that's half of the market quantity. Okay, so that's a Bertrand equilibrium. Okay. Yeah, so here uh, I didn't put, you're right, Anisha, I didn't put this assumption, but let's add it here. Um, I would say firms meet once in the market, in the market, okay? So you would get the same result in a finite horizon, okay? So imagine a game in which firm uh, repeatedly meet each other on the market and you know that you're gonna play the game 10 times, okay? So the question is, is the Nash equilibrium of the single shot game also the Nash equilibrium of the finite horizon uh, game? Okay, and the answer is yes. Why? When uh, you play the game over a finite number of period, to solve this kind of game, you start with the last period, okay? And you use backward induction. So what is the optimal behavior in the last period. Well, in the last period, you're going to behave as is you're facing a single uh, stage game, okay? So in the last period, the equilibrium will be to set price equals marginal cost. Now you can go one period back. Let's say you are in period nine and not in period 10. You know that in period 10, you're going to behave by setting price equals to marginal cost, okay? So what is the optimal behavior in period uh, 10 minus one, well, it's also to set price equals marginal cost and so on, okay? So the Nash equilibrium of the repeated game when the horizon is finite is the Nash equilibrium of the single shot game, okay? But things are going to change if we assume that the game doesn't have an end. Okay, so first let's, let's solve the first question of that problem here. Okay, so here we have a virtual um, setting. We have the market demand. Uh, we have the regular hypothesis of the Bertrand game. And the marginal cost is constant for both firm and it's equal to 20. So the first question is, if the firm meets on the market once, 
what is uh, QIB, so the individual quantity produced by any firm I, uh, the market price, and the profit. Okay, so we have just solved that. We know that if, firm, uh, if the firm meets once in the market, then price, the price of the Bertrand game is going to be equal to the marginal cost. So that's going to be 20. Okay, so what is a quantity produced? Well, you put, you plug 20 in the market demand. So you end up with 100 minus 0 0.5 times 20. Okay, so total market demand is 60. And because we have made this assumption that uh, production is split between both firms, we know that the production um, a, a firm A is the same as firm B, and that's half of the market demand. Okay. What about the profit? So the profit will be the same for firm A and B. Okay. And because you charge price equals marginal cost, the profit are zero. All right. Okay, the second, uh, second question say, both firm uh, agree to form a cartel. And when you form a cartel, you have only one objective, uh, it's to produce at the monopolist level. Okay, so they're gonna set the price at the monopoly level and they are going to coordinate on that uh, monopoly price. So question, what is the market uh, outcome here? So what is, the equilibrium for a monopolist. So you set MR equals MC. That's 100 minus one half, uh, sorry, minus Q equals 20. So the quantity produced by the monopolist is um, Um, 70, and the price charge, okay, okay, I've made a mistake somewhere. Okay, so let's just change this. Okay, so that this is gonna be consistent with my notes. Okay. Um, so this is not going to change. Um, okay. Okay, let, let's finish uh, the monopolies first. Okay, so that's um, 50 minus Q equals 20. So Q M is 30. And the monopolies price is um, 35. Okay. Um, professor? Yes. Sorry, since you changed um, the market demand to 50, yes. so can you just like uh, specify like the calculation on how you got the profit? I mean the price? Okay. Um, so price is 50 minus one half of 30. Okay. So that's 15 minus 15, which is 35. Is it clear? 
Thank you. Okay. So we, we would need to, to double check this, but we are ultimately interested in the profit level, okay? So the profit, whatever the equation of the demand curve, the profit are gonna be zero in, the, in, in that scenario, okay? All right, so I'm, I'm running a little bit late. Uh, so let's move to, uh, well, I want to calculate the profit first. So what is the monopoly's profit? So it's um, Pn minus Mc times Qn. So that's 35 minus 20 times 15. Okay, so that's the profit of uh, an individual firm. Okay, so I'm gonna put I here. And that's 225, okay? So if the firm are able to coordinate on the monopoly price, so they both charge the monopoly price, then they would each get a profit of 225, okay? All right. So question three, assume one firm defects from the agreement and set it, its price slightly below the monopolist price. What is the profit from deviation? Okay, so here we have assumed they coordinate on the monopolist equilibrium, but as we know, uh, this is not a stable equilibrium, okay, because this is not a Nash equilibrium. Okay, so one firm will have an incentive to deviate from that equilibrium. And how does it so? Well, by setting a price slightly below the price of the monopolist. Okay. All right. So by doing so, what is the profit from deviation? So the profit from deviation for the firm that deviate well, the firm set the price just a little bit 35, let's say 34.99, okay? So we'll, for simplicity, we'll assume that it's close to uh, 35. And it gets all the demand, right? Uh, because now it is charging the lowest price. So the profit is a uh, price that's gonna be 35, a little bit less, times um, oh, sorry, minus marginal cost, which is 20, times total market demand. Now it gets all the market demand. So what is all the market demand here? Um, so when the price is 35, that's a monopolist demand, okay? So total market demand here is 30. Okay, so the profit from deviation here is going to be 450, okay? And by actually calculating this profit from deviation, you show that a firm has an incentive to deviate, okay? By deviating from the agreement, it moves from a profit of two, uh, 225 to 450, okay? All right. So that's a profit from deviation. Okay, so I know I'm running uh, late. So you, you can, um, so I'm going to continue and finish this. Of course, you can leave if you have other things to do and catch up later by watching the video, but I'm going to continue if that's fine with you. Okay, is that okay? I believe you can use... Uh, so professor? Yes. yes. Cool. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, next, uh, next week's the exam, right? Yes. Okay. Just making sure. Okay. All right. So we have the profit from deviation. Okay. So now let's move to question four. That's our last question. Represent the Bertrand game in a matrix. 
with price being the actions and profit being the outcome. Okay, so here we have calculated the profit um, when both firms um, behave as in Bertrand. We have calculated the profit they get if they coordinate on the monopolist equilibrium and we have calculated the profit from deviation. Okay, so with all this information, we will be able to represent um, the matrix of the game. Okay, so let's say this is from A, from B, or whatever. So each firm has two strategy. Either it can deviate from the monopolist equilibrium, so let's say defects, and set a price below the monopolist price, okay? Or um, each firm can collude and keep its price at the monopolist level, okay? So in that case, P equals 35. Okay, so that's the same here. All right. So if both firm collude, what profit do they get? Well, we have calculated here um, the profit under collusion. So they behave as like the monopolist and they split the profit and they get 225, okay? So if both firm collude, they both get 225 here. If both firm defect, which means they are playing the Bertrand game, then they both get a profit equals to zero, okay? So that's a Bertrand outcome. Now let's say from B defect and from A stick to the collusion. In that case, we calculated the profit from deviating and that was um, 450, okay? So the firm with effects gets 450 and the other one get no demand at all. So it gets a profit of zero. Okay. And that's the opposite here. So if the game is played once, what is the Nash equilibrium? Okay, so here you can easily see that the best equilibrium for both firm would be to collude. Okay, they would each get 225. But the Nash equilibrium will be the equilibrium in which both firm is going to undercut the price set by the other firm, okay? So the Nash equilibrium here is gonna be both firm defects, okay? So that's question A. Now let's move to question B. Now you assume that the game, so the game, that game, is repeated an indefinite number of periods. In each period, firms set their price simultaneously and follow a trigger strategy defined as full. Okay, so what is a trigger strategy? The so trigger strategy says, I'm gonna set a price equal to the monopolist price, so I'm going to stick to the agreement in initial period, and both firms are going to do so. Okay, so initially they are on the monopolist equilibrium. Then I'm going to set the monopoly price as long as the other firm has set the mon monopoly price in all previous periods. Okay. And then I'm gonna set the Bertrand price. So what is the Bertrand price? It's price equals marginal cost. If the other firm has ever set a price other than the monopoly price, okay? So if my opponent has cheated at least once in the past, then I'm going to punish her by setting price equals marginal cost, okay? And that way I get all the demand and she gets zero profit, okay? So this, um, this combination of strategy is called a trigger strategy. So basically, I, I'm nice as long as you behave nice, nicely and uh, if you don't behave uh, well then I punish you by setting price equals to marginal cost. Okay. 
so if both firm play this strategy, what are the conditions to support a collusive Nash equilibrium? Okay, so what we are going to show here is that firms are actually going to collude when the game is repeated, uh, is repeated um, an indefinite number of periods. Okay, so first we are going to compute the profit, the enter temporal profit from collusion. If the firm stick to uh, setting the monopoly price forever, okay. So, what is the profit from collusion for any given firm? Well, in the current period, I get a profit of uh, 225. I collude. I behave well. I get 225. What do I get in the next period? Well, if I behave well, I know that the other firm is going to behave well and set also the monopoly price. So, I'm gonna get also 225. However, I value the next period less than the current period. Okay, so I'm going to discount, I believe in your book it's called uh, G. I'm going to discount this amount by some value G that's going to be less or equal to 1. Okay, Then what happened in uh, the third period? Well, in the third period, if everyone behaves well, I'm going to get 225. But because it's uh, two periods further, I'm going to discount even more the payoff I get at that period. OK, and so on. OK, so there is no end in that game. OK. So how do I compute? the intertemporal profit here. So I'm, I'm going to ask you just to learn about that. This is a geometric sum, which is equal to two, uh, 225 over 1 minus g. Okay. So that's a profit I get if I collude uh, for the rest of the time. Now, what is the enter temporal profit I get if I defect in the next period? So, in the um, if I defect, then um, I'm going to get a profit of four hundred fifty. Okay, I will get, I'll set a price below my opponent price and I get all the demand. Okay, so I get the monopolist profit. But then, because I cheated, I know that my opponent is going to punish me and it is going to set price equals marginal cost forever after. Okay, in other words, we're going to both get zero profit for the rest of the time. Okay. So knowing that, what are the conditions that would support collusion here? Well, we will observe collusion if and only if the profit from collusion is higher than the profit from defecting. Okay? And now I just need to solve an inequality. So I'm going to replace the profit from collusion by one uh, 225 over 1 minus g. This must be higher than 450. Okay. So that's 1 minus g higher than 225 over 450. So this is g. I'm oh, sorry. Um, this is G smaller than 1 minus 225 over 450. Uh, 
Okay, I have a sign issue here. Professor, I might yes. have to leave my other class side in five minutes. Sure, sure. Uh, just just check the video when right, it is thank online. You so much. Okay. Of course, if you have other things to do, you can leave. Uh, I just want to finish this, or I will have to uh, schedule another session, which I don't want to do. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um. All right. Okay, yeah, so the sign here, sorry, that's the opposite. So, uh, so this is Muller, and so G is higher than this, and this is one half, okay? So, what does it mean? So G has two interpretations here. G is uh, the probability that the game is going to be repeated in the next period of uh, repeating the game. So with this interpretation, it means that is the probability that the game is going to repeat in the next period is high enough, then firms are going to collude on setting a price at the monopolist level, okay? Another interpretation of G is the patience of firms. So if firms are patient enough, it means that um, they wait the payoffs that they're gonna get in the future. And because they wait this payoff, it gives them an incentive to participate to the collusive outcome in the present, okay? So if, um, if this G is higher than one half, then the Nash equilibrium of the repeated game will be that both firms are going to collude forever after, okay? So ultimately, the outcome of the game is going to depend on this value of G here, okay? Um, so just to finish on this, so if we observe this, we have a collusive outcome and this collusion is tacit, okay? So there is no, no objective agreement between firm to sustain price equal to monopoly price, okay? So it's simply, this equilibrium uh, simply emerge because firm are, are patient enough and um, this equilibrium is also self-enforcing, which means that we don't need an external authorities to force firm to set price equal um, monopoly price here, okay? The incentive to keep a price at the monopolist level is um, motivated by the threat of being punished by the other firm setting price equals marginal cost and both firm getting zero profit for the rest of the time. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm 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 done uh, here. I really recommend that you read the book section about this. It's very clear. It's not very long. Um, and that's uh, section twelve point four here. Okay. So do you have question on this? Okay, one question here. Yes, the lecture will be post, uh, posted on Blackboard as soon as it is available. Okay, do you have other question? Uh, hi, Professor. I have yes. a question about um, the midterm for next class. Will say, we say again? I have a question for the midterm for next class. Yes. I was wondering, are we going to have the questions where we have to take a picture um, like do the work on a piece of paper, take a picture and upload it again? Or yeah, will maybe. It, okay. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's a possibility. Um, okay. um, so honestly, I haven't prepared uh, your exam yet. And I think I will be clearer on this one. It's ready. Uh, I plan to do it in the next days. And as soon as it is ready, I'm going to send you an email uh, explaining exactly what will be expected. 
okay, whether you will be expected to scan something or whether uh, everything can be filled in online. I don't know yet, but that's a possibility. Okay, thank you. So, um, make it easy, yeah. I'm gonna try. Other question? All right. So take care, everyone, and I'm going to follow up with uh, with emails very soon. Okay. Take care. Bye bye.